Yeah, turn to um, Luke chapter 19 while you're getting there. Um, One Palm Sunday, no, Palm Sunday, can't talk. One Palm Sunday, a little boy had a sore throat and had to stay home from church with some kind of babysitter. When the rest of the family came home, they were all carrying palm branches. And the little boy asked what they were for. His father told him that people held them over Jesus' head when he walked by. Sad, the little boy in a disappointed voice said, Wouldn't you know it? One Sunday I miss and Jesus shows up. (laughs) Well, he shows up every Sunday. And we've been talking about some of these things about seeing Jesus in the moment a couple weeks ago and recognizing that Jesus is with us all the time. And I kind of want to throw some more things onto that today. So if you're in Luke chapter 19, look at verse 28. I want to begin reading there. Speaking of Jesus, when he had said this, keep that this in mind, by the way, because he just got done saying something. But when he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mount called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where, as you enter, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. And then they brought him to Jesus. They threw their own clothes on the colt and they set Jesus on him. And as he went... Many spread their clothes on the road. Then, as he was now drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now I want to read one more verse to you on top of that. John chapter 12, verse 16 says, His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. That verse comes out of the same description or a similar description of what we call the triumphal entry that we celebrate on Palm Sunday. And interestingly, They didn't really realize what they were doing. Keep that in mind. So let me just start here, though. Who do you think these two guys were? You know, it doesn't say which two disciples these guys were. So we don't know. Could have been two of the twelve. But it could have been other disciples you do realize that besides the 12 that he named apostles, he had other disciples. And in fact, we just read that. That's part of the reason why I read the Luke account instead of the John account, because in the Luke account it says, and the multitude of disciples began praising him, verse 37. Jesus had a multitude of disciples, not just the 12. Whatever these guys were, we know that they were just regular guys because Jesus chose just regular guys to be his disciple. They were, they were folks like you. Look at your neighbor and say, yeah, somebody kind of like you. Just tell them that. Somebody kind of like you. Somebody kind of like you. Well, maybe you're sitting next to the prince or princess of whatever, or they just think they are. But somebody just like you. <laughs> That's the point. Perhaps today, in the era of what seems like bigger and bigger government, we should give them some titles. What do you think? How about... Mm, Secretary of Transportation and Under Secretary of Transportation (laughs) in the Jesus administration. What were they asked to do? Pretty simple. Go, go, he's already on to me. 
Just go untie that donkey over there. You think, you think, by the way, before we get to that part, do you think it was important what they were doing? Okay, yeah, yeah, probably. Do you think they thought it was important? Hmm, not so sure. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing, but again, the scripture said they really didn't understand what they were doing exactly. They were just doing what he told them to do. He knew he was about to present himself as king, them not so much exactly. I mean, they were trying to present him as king. They wanted everybody to know he was king. They believed that he was going to do something right then and there, and they believed that there was going to be this uprising and the, the Roman emperor was going to be thrown off and they were going to take over and be large and in charge. That's what they wanted. I don't think these guys really realized what exactly was happening. None of the disciples did. And I don't think these guys realized how important their job was because they were helping Jesus fulfill prophecy. But they didn't quite get it yet. You know, Jesus had given his disciples things to do before. Cool things. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 8, we read this. Jesus, uh, the, these 12, Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter by the city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, listen to this. This sounds like a better assignment, doesn't it? Preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Now that is a really good assignment. I want to do that one. I don't want to be on donkey duty. I want to be on this supernatural group. I want to be in that crowd. Hmm. Of course, maybe some people. <laughs> Figure it out, guys. Yeah. That's what happens when you put the switches about the height of somebody's... Never mind. Anyway. <laughs> This, this non-high-profile job kind of reminds me sometimes of the things God's sometimes asking us to do. We, we may not realize it, but there may be significance in the things that we do that seem like they're unimportant. All these guys knew was that they were being sent away to steal a donkey. Dave had it right. To steal a donkey. Do you, ever, do you ever notice just how he said it? Jesus said, go into the village opposite you where, where as you enter you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So I'm going to try something here. John and uh, um, Cord, I got this key. I was down here at Mark Motes the other day driving a white Mustang. There's a really nice white Mustang. I like white cars. There's a nice white Mustang down there, and I just borrowed the key. And I want you guys to go down. John will drive you down. Cord, you can drive it back. Burn a little rubber on the way. What? And, and <laughs> he wants to drive. Because all I need is a brick. I'll hotwire it. <laughs> now, don't break the windows. I want it intact. And if anybody asks you, tell them all the preacher needs it. How many of you think Mark Motes would appreciate that all over the place? <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. And since I don't want either of these gentlemen to spend any time at all in the slammer for something so silly, I won't really ask them to do that. Besides that, I have no need of it. <sighs> but, you know, if I were them, I think I would rather go down and tell Mr. Motes that the preacher up the road, he's not there today anyway, it's Sunday, but if they were open and they went down, they said, yeah, the guy up the road, the preacher up the road says he needs the car. I'd rather say it first, at least, right? Because at least if I say it first, he can say no. If I'm already in it driving away, he's not going to be happy. And they're going to call, you know, these other white cars with blue markings on them that run around town and have lights on top. 
So in a way, they may have been having their faith tested too. I don't know. I wonder what they were. And you got to wonder what the people thought when they see these two guys untying this donkey because it does say some people ask them, what are you doing? And they were like, uh, Jesus. And it worked. That's got to be pretty cool too. I wonder how they knew. Like, did they have a dream or did an angel come to them? Or, well, we don't know. Doesn't say. Doesn't say. All I know was this might have been donkey duty compared to, you know, praying for the sick and raising the dead. That's kind of cool stuff. So how about you? How about us? Do we ever feel that our life is sometimes too filled with donkey duty? Psalm 37, verse 23 says, The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. A step is a small thing. But our God is a step-by-step God. One step at a time God. Those guys had to go wherever the donkey was, over yonder, to that village. I wonder what their conversation was like as they went, step-by-step. I wonder what their anticipation was like as they got closer and closer. And I'm not saying it was good anticipation. They might have been, whoa, Jesus has told us to do some weird stuff before, but this one's pretty weird. Grand theft donkey. (laughs) Don't forget, donkeys were, you know, they were pretty valuable. Like most people didn't have a donkey. Most people had feet. And they were just happy to have some sandals if they had those. Let alone having a donkey to ride. It's a big deal. It's more like stealing a Mustang than you think. What if I told you everything we do in the kingdom has supernatural potential? Well, I've been telling you. I've been telling you the last few weeks and a couple of the different messages that we've done. Everything that we do in the kingdom, has potential. Well, but not everything we do is in the kingdom. Why not? What if it was? There are no small jobs or small tasks or not valuable things when we do things the kingdom way. There are no unimportant jobs in God's economy. They all pay really well. In fact, they all pay really, really well because he promises rewards. So whatever God is asking us to do, it's significant. And the scripture teaches that everything we do can and should be done as unto the Lord. Colossians chapter 3 verse 17 says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Do all in his name, giving thanks, praising him. Praise the Lord when you get done cleaning the toilet. What? Why not? How many of you like clean toilets? Well, the rest of you like dirty ones. That's kind of weird. No, I know. Just you didn't get it. Yeah, a dirty trick. Sorry. Colossians chapter 3 <laughs> Also, and just down a few verses, verse 23 and 24. And whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive reward, the reward of inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. Everything we do when it's done as unto the Lord has an inheritance with it. What's that? That's something amazing that he died for you to have and he wants you to receive. Everything we do, when we start changing the way we think, which is hard to do sometimes, I know. Look, I'm not not super good at this all the time. There are times when I mumble and grumble about the things I have to do. And the sad part is, when I'm mumbling and grumbling about the things that need to be done, I'm missing the reward that comes when I rejoice and I'm exceedingly glad and thankful and have praise in my mouth for the things that I'm probably going to do anyway. How many of you know you're probably going to do them anyway? Yeah. (laughs) 
Jesus set the example for this. John 5, 19 says, And then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. Somebody says, well, I don't, I don't know that I see God doing some of the drudgery jobs that I have to do. I don't see God having any problem doing those at all. And Jesus did some things. Not everything Jesus was, did was a miracle. In fact, for the first 30 years of his life, we don't have any actual scriptural miracles recorded. There are stories and there are apocryphal readings that talk about Jesus doing things when he was a child. But his miracle ministry really began when he was 30, which means that he had to live a life like other people. You think his parents ever asked him to do anything? You know, that might be a problem. I don't know. How do you ask Jesus to clean his room when he's Jesus and he already cleaned his room? Do you ever think that he might have been like that? Like Jesus might have been ahead of mom and dad? That would be pretty weird raising a kid who did everything right. I've always said it would be no fun to be Jesus' brother or sister because you're running through the living room and the lamp goes crash and mom comes in. She knows it isn't Jesus. He's Jesus. So you know it's your fault. You can't even blame your brother. It's no fair. (coughs) Jesus did everything, whether it seemed great or small, with purpose. And maybe we should say it this way. Jesus did everything on purpose. Do we do everything on purpose? I'm not sure I do everything on purpose, but what would my life look like if I was more on purpose? Maybe, maybe I should say it this way. What would it look like if I could do everything with purpose? So that now everything that I do suddenly has purpose married to it. Purpose that's more important than maybe I've been thinking about. Maybe I didn't see that this donkey duty was something bigger than what I'm seeing. Maybe I didn't see that this thing that I'm up to can be used by God and for God and with God. And in cooperation with God, something big could happen out of these little things that I do. And so I do my mundane things. And then I come to a place where I begin to realize, wait a minute, God's up to something. And I didn't know it. Just like the disciples didn't know it until later. You know, the God who does an inventory of the very hairs of your head has a plan for your life. And there's no greater ministry than the one that God has called you to right now. Let me say that again. There is no greater ministry for you than the, God, than the one God has called you to right now. Because right now is your opportunity. Like right now. Whenever now is, right now is your opportunity. Let's do this together. Let's all stand up. I usually don't make you stand up in the middle of the sermon, but that'll, you know, a couple people are falling asleep. Now they'll be awake. Awesome. Here we go. <laughs> I don't think anybody was falling asleep. I'm just kidding. Repeat after me. There is no greater ministry than the one that God has called me to right now. Okay, you didn't sound super convincing, but you were still trying to just figure out what I was saying. Let's try it again. There is no greater ministry than the one that God has called me to right now. There is no greater ministry than the one that God has called me to right now. All right, sit down. You're good. (laughs) Because the next thing that God's going to call you to is going to build off of what you're doing right now. The next thing that God has for you is going to start where you are and move from there into the next level of what God wants to accomplish. We've got to be careful because... There is a worldly mindset that can dictate our worth. 
There's a worldly mindset that says, so-and-so over there is more important than me, or what they're doing is more important than what I'm doing. What they're doing is what they're supposed to be doing. You're not supposed to be doing what they're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to be doing. If you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, then you're doing what God made you for, and that's of high value in his economy, in his plan. That's a big deal. I want to do what God gave me to do and not devalue what God gave me to do because God holds it in high esteem. The world may not see it. Other people may not see it, but God sees it. Now, we were reading from Luke chapter 19, remember? At the beginning. There's a whole parable there called the parable of the minus. I'm going to take one verse from that. Luke 19, verse 17. And he said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful in a very little. Have authority over ten cities. That was the parable Jesus tells the disciples just before he does his triumphal entry. And if you remember the parable, it talks about a landowner who gives different things to different people and they come back and they've made it into more. And one of them had been faithful with what he had and he brought back to the landowner or the, the, the big boss, whatever, the investor. And he brought him back more and he says, wow, you've done really good. So because you were faithful in this little thing, now I'm going to give you much. When we are faithful in the things that he has already given us to do, then the opportunities to do great things will be given to us every time. Every time. And I think sometimes, even after we've done some great things, some amazing things, even after we've had those moments, he's looking to see, will they go back to being faithful in the little things? Or now, are they too important, too valuable to do those little things anymore? Well, I did little things all my life. Yeah. I did a few big things. Uh huh. Maybe the more faithful we are in the little things, the more big things we get to do. That's what the scripture seems to be saying. And sometimes the thing that we think is little is a big deal. It's donkey duty. I'm doing that thing that I don't think is a big deal and it turns out that it's a big deal. And I didn't know it when I was doing it. So, I want to end this today. You're going to say, really? You're going to end this today? Yeah. It's going to be a fast message. How many of you are hungry? Okay. We got, we're going to go next door and we're going we're to eat some food. Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to have, we got fun stuff planned. So I was thinking, I wonder if somebody will think, because we're about to ask you guys to do something. I wonder if somebody will think, oh, that's just donkey duty. Because we're going to ask some people to go around and hide some eggs for some kids. Oh, that's not important. It is the little kids, by the way. When you're hiding the eggs, like one right on the step right there and one over there and one over there. Those are good places to hide the eggs for Trinity. Oh, you got the little, and they're going to go out there? She, she reminded me. The littlest kids are going to go out in the uh, foyer, so you'll hide them in plain sight. You did it already? You're no fun. You took care of them. Those are the ones that are easy to hide in plain sight. Well, anyway, we're going to hide the rest of them then in here. Is that what we're going to do? Okay. My wife's so far ahead of me all the time. It's painful. Anyway, let's just end this with this scripture from Philippians chapter 4. I'll wrap it up with, with this. Paul, speaking to the Philippians, says, Now that I speak in, now that I speak in, not, excuse me, <laughs> okay. Context. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. 
my wife and I learned that we had to move to Indiana for a while, but God brought us back here. We were content over there. I have learned whatever state I am in to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. And everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Sometimes we read that, we we quote that 13th verse there. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But what he's saying is, I can do all things, including, you know, everything not working out exactly the way I planned or being exactly the way I thought it was going to be. I can do the little things and the big things. I can work on something that's a small project that seems almost beneath me, and I can do things that are beyond me. By the way, if you can't do things that are beneath you, you'll never do things that are beyond you. Let me say that again. Someone write that down. I got to put that someplace. That's good. It's on Facebook now, yeah. Can't get away. If I can't do things that are beneath me, I will never be able to do things that are beyond me. So I believe that God has a plan, an amazing plan for each of us, and that we need to realize in the middle of the mundane and in the middle of the tough stuff and in the middle of, middle of the things that we think, yeah, nobody cares. God cares. And he's aware And we put a smile on our face and we put some praise in our hearts and we let it come out our mouths so that even if we're cleaning the toilet, we just realize that we're before the throne. Okay, I'm sorry. Couldn't help it. (laughs) You know, no idea what's going through my head right now. Stop it. Stop it. (laughs) I won't do it. I refuse. I had enough head shaking. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, including not tell another dumb joke. Amen? Amen. There we go. It's one way to get an amen. Has anybody got a testimony? I don't want to cheat on, cheat on. You're done telling jokes? Yeah, that's a testimony. Anybody else got a testimony? Say, I'm done telling jokes. That was a testify. You brought people. Yes, amen. That's good. Good, good, good. All right, then, then don't worry about it. No testimonies. God bless you. What? Yes? Oh, okay, come on. Well, he's coming. I just remembered I have one too. Um, I want to give you guys a little idea and um, something you can do. You used to stay here a second, Dave. Uh, something you can do when your phone rings and it's from one of those people. How many of you are getting phone calls from people that just and they're spoofed calls, so it looks like it's coming from town or it looks like it's coming from close by, and they're spoofing you. Anybody getting those besides me? Okay, a few not, a few heads nodding. All right, so here's what I've begun to do. First of all, they're supposed to give you the option to take me off your mailing list, and sometimes they will. You got to listen to a spiel a little bit. You know, a, a, nowadays it's never a person; it's always a recording first. To hear more, press one. To be taken off of our mailing or our list, press two. A lot of times that's what's happened. But I've noticed now, less and less do they give me the opportunity to say, take me off. Like, I don't get to press the two. So I'm starting to press the one or whatever number they ask for. Yeah, I did the other day. I pressed one, and I said, Lord, what do I pray for him for? And the first thing that came to my mind was sore shoulder. And I thought, go for it. The voice comes on and goes, Hello, how are you today? And I said, I am wonderful. But you have a sore sore shoulder, right? Is your shoulder bothering you? And he goes, yeah. And I said, okay, good. Holy Spirit, touch this man's shoulder right now. Bless him and bring healing to his body in Jesus' name. Amen. How's your shoulder? And he says, it's better. And I said, awesome, that's great. Now, I don't have any credit card debt, so what you want to give to me, I don't need. Thank you, goodbye. Now, i got to wonder, did he just tell me that to make me feel good, hoping he could keep me on the phone? Which is their job, by the way. They're supposed to keep you on the phone and talk you into something. Of course, you know, they wanted to give me a way to consolidate my credit card debt. And since I have none, it wasn't going to work. But did he say that or did he actually get healed? And I've had people get healed when I prayed lesser prayers than that. Now, if you can imagine some guy 
in a room full of people, someplace, maybe on the other side of the world, and he's going, this is nuts. <laughs> so cool. What if? Drive-by healings. So I'm just encouraging you. If they're bugging you, I, I have a feeling that company will not call me back again. What do you think? Do you think the devil's going to keep that person, that company, deviling me? Or do you think, and if they do, I'm going to keep praying for healings. All right. Dave, what you got? A couple, couple months ago, I just decided um, I, I'm, I'm going after God. And uh, not that I wasn't serving him, but I just decided to step it up. Step it up big time. And uh, uh, so at work, I'm generally happy. I do my thing and I walked up to a group of guys the other day and I just got a big smile on my face and this one guy looks at me and he just starts laughing and uh, uh, he says this guy walks up here with a smile you know he's just wondering what is going on and, and the foreman who knows me well puts his hand on my shoulder and says don't worry he's just happy and, and uh, that's the message that I want to get across to those that I, I work with because that message raises tons of questions. Yes. What's he happy about? And uh, then a couple days later, there's a new guy uh, working on a robot welder. Uh, and I didn't want him to misunderstand where I was coming from. So I walked up to him. I says, no, I know I do some crazy things, and I laugh a lot. And I says, but I'm a Christian, and I believe in living life to the fullest. And he didn't say a word, <laughs> uh, but he understood very well. It was one of those deals where you make eye contact, and, and you know that they're listening. Uh, and then last night, uh, talking to my niece, her mother's boyfriend was in a really serious accident at work and he, re he got his face crushed. Oh. And uh, uh, long story short, the, the guy was saying uh, that he saw two angels pull him out, him out between a forklift and what he was pinned against. Wow. And uh, he also saw the devil. And, and I really didn't have anything to say to that other than, you know, that I'm aware of, I've never seen an angel uh, but I know what it is to have the presence of God envelop me. Yeah. And, and so opportunity after opportunity after opportunity are, are, are coming up, and I will continue to walk through that door and raise questions in people's hearts. And if they ask me the ultimate question, what it's all about, I am prepared to give them that answer. Good deal. Woo come on.